imagine it's a dark night. Someone approaches you with a gun and they ask you, do you want to be shot in the head or the heart? In the head or the heart? Those both sound like crappy options to me. I mean, how do you choose? As I continue to think about our current situation as a country and how the rest of the world is responding, I keep coming back to the United States facing impossible choices that feel a little bit like having to choose between being shot in the head or the heart. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not a negative Nathan. I definitely don't do doom and gloom. I'm very much an optimist, but I do have to make sure I see things for what they really are. And before this video is over, I promise to give you a handful of actual steps that you can take to help improve your situation and our situation as a country. And unlike most advice you get from stacking channels, I promise it's not simply buying more gold and silver. More on that later. I'm not gonna bore you with all the doom talk of the death of the dollar, desolization, trillion dollar debt, and all the other clickbaity stuff you see here on YouTube. No matter how bad our situation is here in the United States, the sad reality is all the major countries are in far worse positions than we are. That doesn't make our situation good, but it does mean that we're more likely to be one of the last countries and currencies to fail. A lot of that has to do with our supreme advantage of being the world's reserve currency. Right or wrong, good or bad, it's what we currently have and what we have abused, which has resulted in many countries running from the dollar and into gold. So yes, de-dollarization is real, but as Mark Twain wrote, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. The same can be said about the death of the dollar. Regardless of our boneheaded decision to weaponize the dollar and how that opened the floodgates of central banks buying gold to replace some of their reserves. Now, this is where the conversation typically turns to, well, we should dump fiat paper currency and we have to return to a gold standard like the good old days. And I hate to tell you this, but being on a gold standard actually isn't better. And in some ways, it's really romanticized. Both Mike Maloney and Jeff Christian have done great videos covering this point. And they actually point out that we had more monetary volatility while we were on a gold standard. Or as Mike Maloney says, gold standards suck. He did a whole video on this, and I'll try to find it and link it in the description. Also take a look at this article and get ready to pause and read some of this from Reuters, and the title is Why Conservatives Spend Fairy Tales About the Gold Standard, which really speaks to the myth of a gold standard being good for everyone and how it actually really only benefited the top 1%. I know, I know, at least our money would be honest if we went to a gold standard. Hold on to that thought as well because we need to overcome one big hurdle before we can even consider a gold standard. That hurdle is who has gold and how much do they really have? This is where things get scary and really interesting at the same time. The U.S. reports are having over 8,100 tons, but many people believe we have less, and they point to a lack of records of an audit since the, the early 80s. And let's juxtapose that against China, who reports having a little over 2,100 metric tons. But no one really believes that number because of China's reporting history, and when you layer that with their policy that gold does not leave the country, and that number seems severely underreported. If that isn't enough, China also plays a little bit of a shell game here with the world by having different government entities purchase and store the gold, which is then not counted as central bank buying or being a part of their reserves. In a nutshell, we have the US likely overreporting our gold stores and China underreporting there. Well, there's definitely a little bit of a head scratch there. Now let's look at some of these slides related to gold purchases and production because the hypers here on YouTube love pointing to central bank buying, but they always seem to ignore the fact that central banks are also selling. I mean, it's common sense that in order for someone to buy something, someone has to be willing to sell it. Take a look at this slide of Q3 central bank gold reserves and look at the right side where they highlight the largest increases and decreases. I want you to notice that the top five increases in Q3 don't even add up to the amount of gold sold by the top seller, which was Turkey with 132 tons. Hmm. As this article also shows, central bank buying is definitely above pace over the last five years, but I just, as I just shared, that's only part of the story. Don't forget, fundamentally, in order for someone to buy, someone has to be selling. Here's a slide of all the categories of transactions from Q3, but this next slide highlights central bank buying over the last 10 years, and take a look at that. Now let's look at gold production. This little diagram shows which countries produce gold, how much, and how that has changed over time. Now note, in 2007, China replaced South Africa as the world's largest gold producer, and last year alone, they produced 330 tons. So for the last 13 years, China has been the largest producer with around 300 tons a year that they also never let leave the country. And somehow we're supposed to believe that they only have 2,100 tons based off of their purchase history? Come on, y'all. 
This idea is reinforced by an article written by Alistair McLeod, and he points to China having significantly more gold. Later in that article, he also points out that Russia could easily have more than 10,000 tons. If you're following the data, and I hope you're coming to the same logical conclusion that I have, we're screwed. And the last thing we want as Americans is to run to a gold standard for the following reasons. One, we don't have as much gold in hand as, at least in comparison to China and Russia. Two, we're like fifth on the list when it comes to gold production, so we wouldn't even be able to catch up. And three, all the other countries are actively adding to their stack while we're just standing patting with our unconfirmed 8,100 tons. Take a look at this chart that shows who's been buying and how much they've been buying since 2000 or this chart that shows central banks have been net buyers since 2008. Again, as I look at the data and examine the situation, a gold standard or gold-backed currency would not be in our best interest as a country because we quickly become third, maybe fourth, in terms of wealth as a country, and that will absolutely have a direct impact on the quality of our lives and the wealth, though inequitable, but the wealth that we experience as a country. Basically, that option definitely feels like choosing to be shot in the head. So if gold isn't the solution for us as a country, What's the next best option? Brace yourself because I can't believe what I'm about to say here. But here we go. Central bank digital currency. I know. I know. It makes me nauseous just thinking about it. If we could just for a moment have a rational conversation and ignore the flashing red lights of liberty and freedom being taken away from us, a CBDC may be the only way the U.S. can keep its dominance and the Ponzi scheme of money going. Or in other words, the only way we really can kick the can down the road. I know. I know. Your head is still spinning over what I just said. Now, I'm not saying this is a good thing for you and I. I am strictly talking about it from the powers that be, you know, the big thinkers vantage point. They are ready to deploy. It. And when they do, they will promote it as making it easier to transact cross borders, being more secure, or you won't have to worry about counterfeiting or that it will create greater access for the poor, et cetera, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Now, let's put on our tinfoil hats for a moment and let's talk conspiracy theory, or at least my conspiracy theory. I find it interesting how cryptos like Bitcoin and all the rest of them went from being hated and potentially banned by the government to those same people now touting black blockchain technology and potentially allowing BlackRock to start a trading a crypto ETF. Why in the world would the government allow us to transact in something that is in direct competition of the dollar? They wouldn't, which tells me there's a bigger plan at work here. Okay. I wouldn't be mad at you if you paused the video right now and went to wash the stink off of you, and I get it. I feel the same way. But needless to say, CBDCs definitely feel like choosing to be shot in the heart. Another terrible option. As I sit here recording this video, I am hard pressed to come up with other viable options for the situation we face. Turning to gold as money basically puts all the power in the hands of our enemies. A central bank digital currency basically puts all the power in the hands of our other enemy, big government and politicians, that is why I feel like we're screwed either way. In an attempt not to leave you all inflamed and upset with me, I do think there are some things that we can do. One, get your financial house in order. No matter what happens, capitalism is still a game of who owes who money. And the more you owe others, the more likely you are to lose in this game. Two, prepare now. It is better to have and not need than to need and not have. The less reliant we can be on big government, the better off we are. That may look like having a second home somewhere in a rural area where you can go bug out to and get away from the city or grow things to take care of yourself and your family. Three, use more cash. I know that sounds strange, but the more we transact in dollars and cents, the more we create demand for physical money, even if it's just the fiat paper that we don't like, it's a better alternative to the CBDCs. Another bonus to you actually using more cash is that you will actually spend less money because you'll be more aware of your transactions. Four, resist. We can learn a thing or two from the citizens of Nigeria and simply reject the digital currency, which means using the paper money and not the digital currency, and that's the lesser of two evils, frankly. Five, live on less, do more for yourself, and save more. Related to getting your financial house in order, Learning to live on less limits your consumption and opens the door to you doing more for yourself, like canning, making jerky, raising chickens. I don't know what works for you, but I know that if we are less reliant on the government and the traditional systems, the better off we are if we can take care of ourselves. Six, get tangible. Of course, I have to recommend you having gold and silver, but also more tangible assets and tangible skills. Try to pay off your home and your car faster. If you don't have a bug out home, how about if you get a piece of land that you can maybe grow something on? Develop some needed skills like home repair, or auto repair, or things that people will always need in case things really do turn poorly or go very badly. Seven, buy American. 
A major part of our issue as a country is that we stopped reducing things here and started relying on cheaper imports. It's time we go back to that sense of pride and develop the value of buying made in America items. Ultimately, at this stage, this is a thought exercise, but it's better to think about how to respond to a crisis before you're in a crisis. I hope I'm wrong and we don't have to choose between being shot in the head or the heart. My hope for you is that this video made you think and really think about how you prepare and protect yourself for the unknown future. In the comment section, tell us one thing you've done or will do to prepare yourself for the future. What are some alternative ways our situation could play out? And if nothing else, do me a favor, please put an A plus in the comments so everyone knows that you always stack smarter and never stop learning.